Stanford University. The Human Experience. Inside the Humanities at Stanford University. humanexperience.stanford.edu. As you know, a pestilence of unprecedented ferocity started some time ago in the heathen lands of the Great Khan and the Golden Horde, and then, having grown in vigor in Turkey and Greece, spread over the whole Levant and Mesopotamia, and into Syria and Chaldea, and Cyprus and all the Greek islands. Now, this terrible plague is spreading around the Mediterranean Sea and is already starting to penetrate inland to strike many great cities in Italy and France. His voice grew tremulous, and he leaned towards John. In all of this time, the scourge has never weakened nor ceased its movement northwards and westwards towards our land. Ordinary folk are gullible and delight in fancies and superstitions. So we, as intelligent and literate men, have become accustomed to dismiss most of the dreadful stories we have heard. I myself have done this, but we were wrong. Now even the most remarkable of these fantastical accounts are daily being confirmed as true by those who have seen these terrible things with their own eyes. All those who have fled in the wake of the plague have spoken with one voice. Nothing can stop its progress of destruction. Neither closing city gates against all outsiders, nor the breadth of the sea. This was the news that I want to impart urgently to priests like you, so that you might instruct your flock to call on God's mercy to avert this tragedy. Well, unfortunately... It wasn't me reading that excerpt. It, uh, the book was serialized by the BBC, and that was a, uh, a well-known actor. And you'll discover from the way in which I deliver the rest of the lecture that I'm not up to that standard. <laughs> well, the scene there taken from the book is in the library of the Great Abbey of Bury St. Edmunds, and it's between the librarian the priest of a nearby village, which is the village I chose to base the book on, the village of Walsham, which is, is a few miles from Bury, and the infirmary of the abbey, that's the person who looked after the abbey infirmary. And the librarian is telling uh, the priest about the remorseless progress of the plague across Europe and the device I'm using there is uh, to take the librarian as, uh, and the Abbey is known for the quality of its chronicles, who's a chronicler, a sober uh, historian, a good judge of information, and then using uh, contemporary sources to put words into his mouth as to what would have been known at the time, and I think that scene is set uh, in early 1348, before the plague has actually reached England. <coughs> the infirmer, <coughs> who I have as a good friend of the priest, provides other means of uh, getting across information from uh, mid-14th century England on the state of medical knowledge, uh, theories that were being put about on the, uh, the nature of the disease and how it might be avoided. Uh, the book is unusual, and I'll, this is what I'll basically be talking about, because it combines uh, fiction and history. And I'll start off uh, saying a few words about the, the Black Death itself, uh, which we can uh, see from this map anything that's colored there, uh, experienced the plague. The gray bits, we haven't got information on, but my uh, 
judgment is that actually the, the plague just spread much further than we have record of it. It just disappears into Africa and India. Unlike most of these great watersheds and turning points in history, uh, the most recent historical research is actually pushing the death rates higher than they used to be uh, thought to be. And it, it now appears extremely unlikely that uh, less than 40% of the population died. It's probably uh, of the order of 50%, which given the nature of, of plague, there's a great dispute about whether it was plague. I happen to believe that it was, although the disease was very different from the disease today. Uh, if it was plague, having 50%, 40% death rates means that the morbidity rate, that is the proportion of the population catching it, would be at figures like 70 to 75%. It must have looked to people who were experiencing it as if it was the end of the world and that nobody was going to survive. Well, literally scores of books have been written on the Black Death of the mid 14th century and a sizable clutch of new volumes appears every year. Some are devoted to speculating on what the disease actually was, but the great majority trace the progress of the terrible pestilence on its tour of the known world, from its origins in the Asiatic steppes in the early 1340s to its demise in Russia in the early 1350s. Having studied and taught the Black Death for more than 30 years, I wanted to write something different to find a new way of adding to our knowledge and understanding of this massively important but extremely well-worked historical event. I decided to write a history from the bottom upwards, a more direct and immediate history from within the ranks of the common people themselves and even as far as possible from within their minds. I wanted to describe as far as possible what it was like to live and die during what has repeatedly been called the world's greatest natural disaster. A multitude of historians have written about the impact of the Black Death on society, but there's scarcely anything that takes the reader chronologically through the weeks and months of 1348, 49, and 50 in a single location. The dominating historiography of the Black Death is a broad description of the progression of the pestilence across the known world, and then an assessment of its long-term impact. Yet reconstructing the history of a single place can be very revealing and pose many significant new questions. In late 1348, what did villagers hear about the pestilence in England? And I should have pointed out that uh, the village I based the book on is located about there. So what were the villagers in, in Walsham, in Suffolk, hearing about the plague? Where it was raging, how many it was killing, whether it was spreading. What did people feel, think, and experience? What were they told? What did they learn about the experiences of countries and regions while the pestilence raged. Well, here's another excerpt based on contemporary sources. It's a sea captain's speech in the book, which is actually based on a long letter sent from the papal court at Avignon while the plague was rage raging there. I have heard terrible tales of human cruelty when the plague strikes. The sick are often treated like dogs by their families who put food and drink next to their bed and then flee, leaving the poor creatures to die alone, uncared for and unconfessed. There are few doctors who will visit the sick for fear of certain infection, even if they are promised riches. Frightened priests also fail to perform their sacred duties, denying their parishioners the last rites and so abandon their souls, trembling on the edge of everlasting damnation. Well, how did this knowledge that was reaching England 
the intensifying injunctions of church leaders, parish priests, for attendance at mass, for confession, for penitential processions, impact on individuals? How was the work of villagers as cultivators, pastoralists, and laborers affected? How much income did they lose by the disruption to their lives? How severely did the opportunities or inclination to trade decline and with what consequences? How convincing did the villagers find the favored explanations that the ferocious pestilence was being visited by God on an unacceptably sinful people in order to encourage them to reform their behavior? And if they were convinced, how did this change their views of God and the church that interpreted his will? We know that the half or a little more that survived the divine scourge stood to gain massively in terms of property, access to land and wages, and high wages for their labor. But how well placed were they to seize the new opportunities? Did they have enough expertise and capital to farm efficiently the land they inherited? And were they sufficiently wise and bold? The Black Death must have had a massive impact psychological impact on the survivors, but what form did it take? Well, I decided to write a precise chronological history of the tumultuous years of the mid-14th century, seen through the eyes of those who lived and died in the ferociously lethal epidemic. And in order to get the right amount of rich detail and original perspective, I decided to base it on a single exceptionally well-documented village. Well, the 14th century and the peasantry are fields of history that I know well. And my intention was to draw from the available documents any clues, no matter how small, seemingly insignificant, about how life was lived at this time by ordinary people, uh, to write a history from the inside, from their perspective, the perspective of the peasant and the parson rather than the traditional perspective of lords and bishops, kings and princes, and instead of the grand sweep of time and space embraced by so many books on the Black Death, I wanted to recreate in as much detail and as completely as possible the life in this village as it progressed month by month through the traumatic years of the mid-14th century. I knew this hadn't been attempted before, but I was really quite shocked at how impossible it was to write that sort of history using sources in a conventional manner. Uh, the reasons for this are, are obvious in a way. Uh, the lives of the mass of the people, everyday life in particular, uh, is generally poorly recorded, obviously much uh, more uh, poorly recorded than that of uh, the people who run the country, the great leaders, institutional histories. And of course, the records get poorer the further back in time one goes. When we reach the 14th century, there are no diaries reminiscences or correspondence, particularly in, in 14th century England, which has uh, marvelous records of farm accounts and uh, manor courts, but actually is bereft of uh, correspondence, reminiscences, or e even informative chronicles on this period. In fact, there's scarcely any truly personal information about the ma massive men and women who lived at the time. They were illiterate, and their rulers and betters were not concerned to write much about them. The sources we have, and there's an abundance of sources for 14th century England, uh, sermons, moral literature, manuals written for the guidance of parish priests, liturgies, theological debates, uh, legislation, art, artifacts, and much more besides, have all been used effectively to illuminate the world of the mid-14th century, but they can only take us so far. 
Surviving documents reflect the motives and priorities of the lay and ecclesiastical lords who commissioned them and the clerks and administrators who compiled them. Therefore, the records concentrate on largely impersonal matters. Theology, liturgy, administrative procedures, legal disputes, community regulations, land holdings, the exercise of authority, the extraction of payments. So I soon began to realize that I either had to give up what I wanted to do or do it in a different way. And I found myself moving in a, in a partly subconscious way towards writing something that I didn't know whether I was going to publish or not because I felt it was a very dangerous thing to do. I decided to flesh out the events and the characters <coughs> in the village beyond the limits that these fragmentary, prosaic, and frustratingly oblique laconic sources would take us. And in a series of stages during the writing, I moved progressively from a conventional history to telling a story creating dramatic scenes, then composing dialogue, and much more besides. I had considerable doubts about what I was doing, but I was encouraged by colleagues and by the thought that if the gaps in our knowledge have to be filled in order to attempt answers to important questions, then historians uh, shouldn't leave this task entirely to novelists, dramatists, and filmmakers. Uh, one of the central pillars of methods applied by historians is to proceed from the known to the unknown. Historians recent, uh, routinely assemble and study the facts they gather and then use them as a basis for tackling issues and formulating answers to questions that lie beyond where the facts can take them. In a sense, all I was doing was trying uh, in all admittedly in a decidedly more explicit and adventurous fashion to do just that. So what is different about my book on the, the Black Death? Well, the book's novelty stems from the direct and explicit methods that I've adopted to fill these gaps in our knowledge. And I, I could go on at great length, but I'm not going to about how historians routinely make things up, in, or putting it more positively, because I've done it to an even greater extent myself, they speculate in order to bridge gaps in the records and interpret them and provide a coherent story. I did this in a very uh, explicit fashion. A multitude of scenes are totally fictional, episodes invented, uh, there's a lot of dialogue, and the voice of the narrator of the book, you have to have a narrator taking you through it, is not a historian of the 21st century explaining why uh, he or she has selected this piece of evidence and what it means. It's actually the voice of a contemporary writing a few years after the event. And therefore, the main body of the text bears some resemblance to a novel. Yet, it was intended as a history book, and I believe it is a history book. It's not just because it is underpinned by a scholarly apparatus. There's 30 pages of uh, uh, endnotes which show exactly where each uh, main uh, piece of text is drawn from and gives you the, the sources it's based on. Uh, there are 30 pages of historical introductions to uh, each of the chapters. It's not a history book also just because extensive passages from contemporary sources are repeatedly put into the mouths of characters in the book or used to provide the backdrop drop to the action. It's not even 
because of the sustained attempt to preserve historical accuracy wherever possible. I think it, it's a history book because the prime aim is to teach the reader about what happened at the time. And the fiction is a servant of the history. It's there to get across the history. And I've thought long and hard about the difference between uh, what I was attempting to do because I've been invited to write methodological articles and some people have suggested, I think, quite wildly that this sort of might presage a new sort of history, is actually to distinguish between uh, the use of fiction to further an understanding of history and what historical novelists do. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.